Let's look also in uh, Deuteronomy 6. Now this is general instruction for Israel as a nation. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 7. Here is the great basic commandment of God. When Jesus was asked which is the first and the great commandment, this is what he answered. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. The first outcome of that commandment is your word, my words shall be in your heart and you'll teach them to your children. That was the first thing that God spoke about. And just to confirm that, look in the 11th chapter for a moment of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 11, verses 18 through 21. Deuteronomy 11, 18 through 21. You shall therefore impress these words of mine on your heart and on your soul. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. And you shall teach them to your sons, talking of them when you sit in your house, or when you walk along the road, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. The first responsibility, teach them to your sons. And notice that the setting for teaching is not the religious institution. It's the home. It's the family relationships. When you lie down, when you get up, that's in the morning and at night. When you walk by the way. Children quickly discern between what is religious and what is real. And if they only get religious instruction in a religious setting, then they divide between religion and real life. And if the religious instruction comes from mother and not from daddy, the little sons will say, when I grow up, I want to be like daddy. And they associate religion with female activities. And of course, for any boy, that's sissy. So he's just waiting till he can come to the end of it. But that's not the way God arranged. He said to the fathers, you teach your sons. And don't, let, don't go to the synagogue for the rabbi to do it. You do it at home. A lot of parents today want the youth minister to do for their children what only they can do. God has given you that responsibility and you cannot transfer it to anybody else. Thank God for what the youth minister can do to supplement what you can do, but it cannot take the place of what you do. Then God said, and I like this, this is the outcome. Verse 21, So that your days and the days of your sons may be multiplied on the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give them as long as the heavens remain above the earth. Now in the margin it says, literally, as the days of the heavens on the earth. I prefer the King James translation, which says as the days of heaven on earth. Because I believe that's exactly what God had in mind. He said, this is how it is in, in our family in heaven. If you do your task, your family in heaven will be like, your family on earth will be like the family in heaven. I sometimes ask American parents, how many of you have homes that are like heaven on earth? And if you don't, who's to blame? Now you say, well, that's the Old Testament. <laughs> Let's give you Ephesians 6 for a moment. Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, 
but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Whose responsibility? Father. That's right. Cannot be shifted to the mother, cannot be shifted to the youth minister, cannot be shifted to the church. It's the parental responsibility resting primarily on the father. He is the prophet of his home. And then he's the king. And the word king, this side of the Atlantic is kind of remote and antiquated, but it means ruler. It's not just an ornamental person who comes out on certain state occasions and rides in a coach. It's the ruler. Going back for a moment to Genesis 18:19 which is the verse that tells us why the Lord chose Abraham. For I have chosen him, or I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. Notice that key word, command. It's the responsibility of the father to command. That doesn't mean he has to be a dictator. But it means he has to exercise authority. He has to determine the basic way the family is to be run. How much time do the children spend in front of television? What programs may they watch? What programs may they not watch? What time do they go to bed? So on. Those are father's decisions. If they're transferred to the mother, the whole family will become lopsided. You can contrast Lot if you want to. I don't think we need to turn there, but Lot and Abraham separated. You can read it in the 13th chapter of Genesis. Lot headed for Sodom. He didn't set a good example to his family. He got out by the skin of his teeth. His wife didn't make it. He got two daughters with him, and as I understand the story, and it's not absolutely clear, his sons-in-law and any other members of his family perished. The lesson is this. Lot took his family into Sodom, but he couldn't get them out again. That's a fearful responsibility. That's the difference between Abraham and Lot. That was why God chose Abraham, and he didn't choose Lot. Let's look at the example of Joshua. Just one verse. Joshua 24. Verse 15. Joshua is giving his final talk to the people of Israel. He says to them, Joshua 24:15, If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, my family, we will serve the Lord. That's a man speaking. He says, I not many make the decision for myself, I make it for my family. I am the ruler of this house. I determine which way things are going to go. As for me and my family, We will serve the Lord. That's a man speaking. It's a man's privilege. My observation is, if a father will accept his responsibilities, God will give him the authority. But if he reneges, he loses his authority. Turn to the New Testament. Acts 16. Verse 31 and following. This is the incident where Paul and Silas had been thrown into jail in Philippi. They were singing and praising the Lord at midnight. Earthquake came, the doors were open, everybody's bands were loosed. And the jailer was about to commit suicide and Paul stopped him and said, Don't do it, we're all here. Then here's the end of the story. He said in verse 30, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? 
And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved, you and your household. Don't leave out the last few words. Our excessively individualistic picture of salvation tends to say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. But that's not the whole text. You will be saved, you and your household. Salvation in God's economy is primarily a household business. It's abnormal for it not to be the household. Can be. They spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night, washed their wounds, and immediately he was baptized, he and all his household or family. He got the message. He believed and it happened. He was a father. Some years ago, a dear lady came to me. Her husband wasn't saved. Her children were not walking with the Lord. And she asked me to pray with her. And trying to be helpful, I quoted to her this scripture. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And we prayed together. But after she left, the Holy Spirit very quietly said to me, you misquoted that scripture. It wasn't said to a woman. It was said to a man. And that's different. The man has the scriptural right to make the decisions for his family. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, ladies, I'm sure there are many of you here who are in that ha unhappy position. I don't want to leave you without a word of comfort. You can go to the book of Joshua and you can find a lady who was by no means a desirable character. She was a harlot. But she prayed her whole family in through her faith. So, I'm not saying there isn't hope. But let's not deviate from scriptural principles when we offer comfort to God's people. This is the scriptural principle. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved, and your family. Addressed to the Father, the ruler. Early missionaries, when they went to other lands to bring the gospel, operated on a certain principle. When they went to a tribe, they went to a chief. And if the chief was converted, the tribe was converted. They started from the head down. That's how St. Patrick converted on. He went to the chiefs, the kings, the rulers. That's how Mackay brought the gospel to Uganda, a book I'm just reading now. It's how the early missionaries in Africa and other countries operate. It's a scriptural principle. Doesn't always work. But it's illogical not to go to the head. Why convert the left foot and then have awful struggles with the rest of the body? Convert the head. It will tell the rest of the members what to do. God is so practical. Because unfortunately some families today are standing on their heads. <laughs> One more scripture, just to come to the realm of principle again. First Timothy, chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, talking about an elder. What are the qualifications for an elder? He must be one who manages, the King James says, rules, his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? See, there's a very close parallel between the family and the church. That's why, and I'm being frank with you, I have real difficulty accepting women pastors. Because there is no question whatever that the man is to rule the family. And I don't see how they can get into the car and go to church and switch roles in the car. 
<laughs> just seems to me it can't be done. And it does say here that the elder is to be the husband of one wife. It does not suggest she is to be the wife of one husband. Uh, now, I'm not saying that to be awkward. I'm not aiming at people. I just believe there are basic principles built in the human life, and if we ignore them, we're in trouble. God hasn't adjusted the way he arranged the world. It's still the same. The world may try to adjust it, but the result is a mess. Now, I want to suggest to you that successful fatherhood will produce in the family and in the children two primary results. Security and maturity. And unsuccessful fatherhood will produce certain results which are not so precise because it's more difficult to describe a mess than it is to describe an ordered home. I've seen ladies who have in their kitchen a little text that says, God bless this mess. I would never put that on the walls of my kitchen. I don't want my home to be a mess. It's a bad confession. There's another set of texts which says Christ is the head of this house, the unseen guests, etc., etc. I want to tell you that there's a seen head in every house. <laughs> and don't hide behind the unseen to ignore the seen. <laughs> It's all right, I don't say take that one off your walls, but bear in mind that the husband is the head of the house. Christ is the head of the husband, not of the house. The husband is the head of the woman. What are the results of failure? I'll give you three, but as I say, you could multiply these. The first one is rejection in the children. A sense of rejection, of not being loved, not being wanted. The next is disorder. Things are not running smoothly. There's a lot of cross purposes and cross forces at work. And the third is rebellion. If people do not learn discipline at home, they usually go out into the world undisciplined. And they take it out on the world. They tend to become anti-church, anti-school, anti-government, anti-establishment. We don't need to dwell on that because we've seen a whole generation in the United States that basically went that way. And they went that way for this very reason. Poor parenting. Most of them, and I, I know many of them, many of them are very close to me today. Most of them really never knew what it was to have a real father who behaved like a father. Their parents gave them things, like education, and cars when they grew up, and swimming pools. But they were not fathers to me. And my personal conviction, this is based on experience, not on the teaching of psychology, though I think psychology would probably confirm it, is that every child is born into the world with one primary longing, which is for love. And primarily the love of a father. And I believe it's in the arms of a father that a child learns what real security is. And the child that hasn't had that experience probably is an insecure person. I think there's something about the strength of a father that gives that little child a sense of absolute security. Here I am, Daddy's got me in his arms, nothing can happen to me. And I believe it's God's purpose for every child to learn that security very early in life. 
A mother's love is wonderful and can do a tremendous amount. But it's not a substitute for that particular male brand of love, which is the real source of security. And not merely must a father love his children, but he must learn to express his love. Because unexpressed love really doesn't do the job. It's certainly better than anything else. Now, I grew up in Britain. Many of you, I imagine, are from a Dutch background. Quite a lot of you, anyhow. There's something in common between the British and the Dutch. Neither of them are emotional people. <laughs> That's an understatement. My father never really expressed warm love for me. I know he loved me. I really only discovered how much he loved me when I began to take the wrong course in life and saw how it affected him. It was a revelation to me. It shocked me. I didn't realize that my behavior could hurt him that much. But the kind of love we're talking about has to be expressed. It has to be outgoing. That bumper sticker that you've probably all seen, have you hugged your kid today? It's a very relevant question. An unhugged kid is an un insecure kid. Then you get problems at school and you blame the teacher. At the school, the problem started at home. And so such a child grows up wondering, am I really loved? Why doesn't Daddy love me? And that child may never share that feeling. And probably it can't even express it. But it's the root of all its subsequent problems. In the Ministry of Deliverance that I've been in for probably 16 or 17 years, I've learned gradually that there are three different sections there's what I call the branches, the trunk, and the root. When I came into deliverance, I was busy chopping off branches, like alcohol or nicotine or something like that. Then I realized you can cut off endless branches, but the tree goes on growing. Then I got down to the trunk. But then I realized that below the trunk, below the surface, are the roots, and it's the roots that keep the tree growing. And... I began to find out that if you can deal with the root, then you don't have any more problems. And I discovered, in my personal observation, this is a matter of observation, it's not a matter of theory, the main root of demonic problems is rejection. The deepest wound of the human heart is rejection. And countless I would venture to say millions in the United States today, in some degree, are carrying that inner wound. Why didn't my parents love me? Or does my father really love me? And in many cases, this affects their relationship with God, even if they become Christians. They're still not really sure of God's love. Because they've never known what it is to be sure of a father's love. Now, I have got three more things to say. Time is, is moving on, but I'm going to come to a very practical application. Let me first interpose two more things. Then I'm going to come back to this question of rejection. And I'm going to tell you the remedy. And I'm going to read a letter from a young woman who found the remedy. But let me say there is one major satanic force that opposes fatherhood, maleness, and therefore family. It's a spiritual force, and I call it Jezebel. Jezebel is a very, very significant woman in the Bible. She's mentioned six times in the Old Testament and once in the New. She's a type of something. Uh, I'd like to read just the first place in the Bible where Jezebel is mentioned. This could be a, a sermon on its own, but I'm not going to try to do that. First Kings, chapter 1, verse 1. 
chapter 16. Verses 30 and 31. This is about the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom. 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 30 and 31. And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And that was not a little. And it came about as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, that he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went to serve Baal and worshipped him. That was his biggest error. He married Jezebel. And as a result of Jezebel's influence, he turned away altogether from the worship of the true God of Israel to the worship of a false god. Study the events that follow. You'll see that in to all intents and purposes, Jezebel took over the running of the kingdom of Israel through her husband. She did not scruple to take the ring from his finger, which was the mark of authority, sign letters with it. She was a murderess. She was a persecutor of the prophets of God. She destroyed all whom she could get her hands on. She was number one enemy of the prophet Elijah. And even Elijah, who could deal with 850 false prophets, ran from Jezebel. When I saw that, it opened my eyes to the tremendous evil power that Jezebel represents. What does that power do? It does today what it did then. It emasculates males. Ahab, her husband, became a spifer, a figurehead. She took over. There are two key words, manipulate and dominate. Where it can dominate, it will, and where it can't, it will manipulate. But it will get its way. Doesn't emasculate males literally, but it emasculates them in their two primary functions. Husband and father. Removes their authority and makes them, in a sense, just like Ahab. Figurehead. As I see the situation in America today, that is our number one problem. It would be hard to find any areas which that force has not infiltrated. Wherever it works, the ultimate result is the breakup of the family. It may not appear to achieve that end, but it does. Now, when Jezebel gained that position of power. God had one answer. What is God's answer to Jezebel? It's Elijah. God brings on his heavy artillery. I don't suppose there was a more powerful figure in the Old Testament in a way than Elijah. God didn't underestimate Jezebel. He knew what it would take. So, wherever you see Jezebel, you know you need Elijah. And wherever you find Elijah, you know the problem is Jezebel. Now, I say that for a reason, because Elijah hasn't finished. You can interpret this passage various ways. I'm not concerned which way you interpret it. But there is still more for Elijah to do. Let's turn to the last chapter of the last book of the Old Testament. which is the book of Malachi, chapter 4, the last two verses, verse 5 and 6. 
these two verses, in a way, really, to me, are such strong confirmation of the inspiration of the Bible. This book was written many, many centuries after the book of Kings. And it was written more than 2,000 years before our present time. And yet it relates so accurately to both. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And it would seem to be only just a little before. In other words, it's one major aspect of God's preparation for the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the land or the earth with a curse. So what is the great end time social problem? It's fathers and children out of right relationship. What will be the result if that's permitted to continue? What will God do? Smite the earth with a curse. That's God's estimate of the seriousness of that problem. What's God's answer? I will send you Elijah. What will he do? Turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Children to their fathers. And no, it's the fathers that need to turn first. Fathers need to be awakened to their responsibilities. I want to tell you, you can be the president of the bank. You can have a very fine... Handicap in the golf course. You can be the mayor of the city. But those are not your primary responsibilities. Your two primary responsibilities as a man are husband and father. And if you succeed in all the others and fail in those, you're more of a failure than you are a success. And all the other successes cannot cover up those two basic failures. Why did Elijah have to come? Or does he have to come? Or will he have to come? What's the problem? Who's at work? Jezebel. What does she do? She alienates fathers from children. She insinuates herself. She takes over in many areas the male role. She breaks down the divine order of the family. That's exactly where we're at. Let's be realists. Let's face the fact about Jezebel. If she gets at us, she'll kill us. She'll destroy the church. She'll tear the family apart. She'll ruin your life. She'll ruin the lives of your children. You might as well see the truth about it. And if you need to repent, repent. Now, very briefly in closing, I want to tell you the solution, God's solution for the problem of rejection. The problem of rejection that stems initially from an unhappy parental background it may not have been actively unhappy. It may have been passively unhappy. You longed for affection and love and security, which you never had. You've gone through life with a, something missing deep inside you. The mark of rejection, in a sense, is like this. You're always on the outside looking in. You wish you could be inside, but you somehow never really believe you can get there. One of the problems of people who've suffered rejection is that they are unable to show love. The scripture says about our relationship with God, we love him because he first loved us. I believe psychologically that's true. None of us can express love till we've received love. A child or a person that has not received love cannot express it, even though they may feel it. I've dealt with many, many women, mothers, 
And we've traced this thing back from their mother to their mother's mother to their mother's mother's mother and so on. It's come down like an evil inheritance from generation to generation. This inability to be warm and outgoing and loving. And I've said to them, listen, at some point we've got to cut this chain. Finish with it. Why don't you be the one so that you can raise sons and daughters, particularly daughters, who will be able to love their children the way their children need to be loved. Now, the great key is to understand that Jesus on the cross endured our rejection. He took our sins, he took our sicknesses, he took our pains, he took our curse. That maybe we know. But what maybe news to some of you was, it wasn't all that that killed Jesus. Jesus died of a broken heart when his father didn't answer his prayer. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that he could not bear. So Jesus knew the absolute depths of rejection on the cross. I believe medically the evidence is very strong. He died of, literally of a broken heart. Why was he rejected? Shall I tell you why? That we might be accepted. He bore our rejection that we might have his acceptance. He dealt with the rejection problem by his death. We have to learn to pass from rejection to acceptance through the death of Jesus on our behalf, coming to God, acknowledging him as our Father, and entering into his love. About ten years ago, maybe I was in a camp meeting, I was the speaker at a meeting, and I was on my way across the campground to get to a meeting. And I was in a hurry because I was, had to speak. And as I was going, there was a lady going equally rapidly in the opposite direction. We basically ran into one another. After we'd collected ourselves and picked ourselves up, she said, Oh, Mr. Prince, I was praying that if you were to speak to me, we'd meet. <laughs> I said, We've met. What is your problem? And I said, I can give you two minutes. Well, she began to speak. And after about one minute, I said, Stop. We don't have any more time. I think I know what your problem is. I want you to follow me in a prayer. And in this prayer, I just said, now you say these words up to me. And I, I don't remember. God, I thank you that I'm not rejected, that I'm not unwanted, that you love me, that you're father, my father, that I belong to your family, that heaven is my home, that I belong to the best family in the universe, that you really love me, you are my father. Thank you, God. Having said that, I said, goodbye, I have to go. About a month later, I got a letter from her. She described the situation, how it had happened, reminded me of it. She said, I just want to tell you, saying that one simple prayer has changed my whole outlook on life. I am a different person. That really is so typical and so well expressed. My observation is that it, it relates in some way to the lives of maybe 50% of people in modern America. And if I were to estimate the percentage, I'd make it higher, not lower. Now, you may be here today, and as you've listened to me, somehow or other you've been able to identify with what I've said about the lack of real father's love, the lack of real security. And in many ways that's affected your relationship with God, your Father in heaven. You don't need to be ashamed or embarrassed. Because it's come about through a set of circumstances for which you were not primarily responsible. So I'm not pointing a finger or laying blame on anybody. But what I want to say to you is, there is a remedy. If you can see that part of the atonement of Jesus and the climax of it was dealing with rejection. That he took your rejection that you might have his acceptance as God's well-beloved son. And if you will in faith accept this transaction, believe it in your heart and say it out with your mouth, 
I want to assure you, on the basis of scripture and of personal observation, can solve this deep inner problem in your heart. I would like to lead you in a prayer before we close this meeting. I'm going to just lead you in these words, but address them to the Lord. In fact, be more specific. Address them to God the Father. All right? Say these words after me. Oh God, I thank you that you are my Father, that you gave your Son Jesus to die in my place, to bear all my sins, my guilt, my curse, and my rejection. I thank you that Jesus was rejected in order that I might be accepted, that I might come to you, my Heavenly Father, and really know that I'm your child, that I'm not unwanted, I'm not rejected, you're not keeping me at a distance. You love me, you want me, you invite me to come to you. And I come to you now, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, I have a father in heaven. I belong to the best family. I'm a child of God. Thank you, Father, for your love. I love you too. Amen.